Good morning, everybody. Good morning. It's great to see you, and welcome to our uh, service, our time of worship together. Uh, it's yeah, it's lovely to be able to welcome you and to come in here where it's dry and warm on a bit of a, a dreary autumn uh, morning. So, thank you for coming. Thank you for joining us, and an especially warm welcome to you if you're visiting with us. It's great to have you with us this morning. My name's Al McInnes. I'm part of the, the ministry team here, and I'll be leading the, the front end of the service. Uh, but our preacher this morning is Keith Nicholson, who will be uh, known to some of you. I think Keith, uh, when he was here previously, was a wee bit smaller and had less facial hair. Um, <laughs> he grew up here. So he'll be known to some of you. Keith is uh, studying at Edinburgh Theological Seminary. He's a candidate for ministry with the Free Church. And he's on placement in Ross Skeen uh, at the moment, but he's taking the service preaching for us this morning. So um, welcome to, to Keith and Lizzie. But now let's begin our time of worship together with a call to worship. And this is uh, some, we'll begin with some selected verses from Psalm 119, where it says, How can a young person stay pure? By obeying God's word. I praise you, Lord. Teach me your decrees. I will study your commandments and reflect on your ways. I will delight in your decrees and not forget your word. Be good to your servant that I may live and obey your word. Open my eyes to see the wonderful truths in your instructions because your word is a lamp to guide my feet and a light for my path. God speaks to us, and that's why we're gathered here this morning. Um, it's not just because we like coming. Some of us are maybe here because family members have uh, expected us to be here. But um, the reason the church gathers is because God speaks, and his word is life. But also his word is really challenging, and sometimes when we hear his word, uh, we recoil from it. We don't want to follow. Uh, and in John 6... Jesus is speaking and it says after this, many of his disciples turned back and no longer walked with him. So Jesus said to the twelve, do you also want to go away? And Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? Because you have the words of eternal life and we have believed and have come to know that you are the Holy One of God. God speaks and his word is life and that's why we're here is to, to hear him speak and to pray that uh, as that word goes out it would take root in our hearts and, and bear fruit. So let's begin our time of worship together by uh, singing his praise together, uh, the hymn How Great Is Our God. If you're able please stand with us and we can sing together. Splendor of the King, all in majesty, let all the earth rejoice, all the earth rejoice, he loves himself. Oh, 
So many other things, Lord, that our hearts are distracted by, that our hearts to, are drawn uh, to worship instead of you. But Lord, we, as we uh, come to your word, as, we, uh, as you reveal yourself to us, Lord, we realize that there is nothing um, that compares to you. That there is no God like you. There is nothing that can captivate our hearts um, or breathe life and light into us uh, like you. That all other things that we worship instead of you are in fact idols that are, are mute and, and dumb and are deaf, that cannot hear us, that cannot guide us, cannot speak uh, truth to us. But Lord, in you we find light and life and hope. In you we find guidance and truth. In you we find true wisdom that as we hear your word, as we follow it, as we listen to it, that you promise to lead us and to give us life. And Lord, we thank you and praise you for that. Lord, we realize that you have done this not because we deserve it, but because of your goodness, because of who you are, because of your love, your great love for us. So Lord, it is a joy and a privilege to be able to gather together here this morning. But Lord, as we gather, we have to be honest. We have to confess to you that uh, we've come, each of us, with various things on our hearts and minds this morning. Lord, some of us maybe don't even want to be here. We're here because others have expected us to show up, or maybe out of some sense of duty or habit. But Lord, we thank you that uh, you meet us in our place of need, that you uh, have shown your great love to us by sending your, your son and that he humbled himself not just to being born in poverty, uh, born as a man, but that he humbled himself even to the point of death and to death on a cross, all in obedience to you and all in order that he might bring those that you have called to yourself home to you. Lord, I thank you that whatever place of need we find ourselves in, however uh, deep or dark a hole we maybe feel uh, we have sunk into, that your grace goes deeper and that your heart towards us is, is gentle and lowly and humble and that you have compassion on us, that you are able to sympathize with us and that our Savior prays on our behalf and that our grief and our pain and our, our hurt is felt by him. Lord, I thank you that he doesn't just empathize with us, but Lord, that he has taken that sin and that shame and taken it on himself and it has been nailed to the cross with him in order that we might have his righteousness and his life in us. 
Lord, we praise you for that. And I ask, Lord, that you would help each and every one of us here, whether we're here in person this morning or joining in online, that, that we would know that peace, that love, that hope, that life, that fellowship, that joy that comes from our Savior, Jesus. And Lord, we pray especially for our brothers and sisters who aren't able to be with us this morning. Lord, I know that there are those who would long to be able to gather and uh, Lord, it's a, a source of, of heartache for them that they're unable uh, to, to come out any longer. But we pray, Lord, that they would know your comfort and even as we are apart physically, that even now they would very much uh, know the joy uh, and the fellowship of being united in Christ. And Lord, as we, we come together this morning, we do so in a world that is broken and fallen and that shows us day in and day out signs of being broken. Lord, as we hear um, politicians and leaders and folk in the media um, saying things that we struggle to believe or saying promises that we doubt whether they will be able to keep them or uh, avoiding responsibility and passing the blame to others. And Lord, it, it uh, disheartens us, it, it discourages us. And Lord, if we're honest, we have to confess that we also see those traits in our own hearts. So Lord, we pray that you would forgive us of that and you would help us to uh, follow you, that as we were hearing in our call to worship, that we would hear your voice in your word. And Lord, that uh, in your word, we would find truth and hope. So we ask that you would go with us now into the rest of this service, that you would meet with us, but also into the rest of the day and the days ahead. Lord, that we would know you and the comfort of knowing that you go with us. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, well, we are going to, you can remain seated and we're going to have our next item of praise. And while we have this item of praise, we will take up uh, the offering. And if you're visiting with us, please don't feel any obligation to, to give to the offering. This is an act of worship for those of us who meet here regularly. So we're going to sing uh, the hymn Grace. You can remain seated and the offering will be taken up as we sing. Grace, I am. 
morning, everyone. It's uh, really good to be with you. I was actually uh, just reflecting on that uh, in the first half of the service. Uh, growing up here, um, I think it's probably been about two decades before uh, since I've been here, and then in the space of two weeks I've been here twice. But it's uh, really, really good to be back. Uh, I was just thinking there and reflecting on God's goodness to each one of us um, and how the seed has been sown for many years here, how that's ultimately taken root in my life and continues to encourage and build up each one of you in our, our Lord Jesus. So I, I was getting a little bit tearful, I'm not going to lie. Um, so it's, it's really, really good to be with you. But uh, let, me, let me first just give thanks um, for that. I'm just going to move the mic. Let me give thanks. Father God, thank you that we can come to you with our praise. We can come to you uh, and look back on your your goodness to us uh, down through the ages, that we have a great hope uh, in you. We can see how you have provided each and every day, each and every moment. Uh, and Lord, you can we can even point um, to the building that we're gathered in, how you have uh, you've created so many opportunities in so many different ways that have allowed um, this building that we can gather in and praise you um, to be refurbished uh, for your glory. Lord, thank you for uh, the ways in which we could never have even imagined, even in the skills that you've given so many here in the congregation who have, uh, in a way, have been able to generate and uh, support this work. Um, but Lord, we, we think and uh, reflect on the work throughout the your world, uh, in your church. Lord, thank you that we are a part of a a great family and you are uh, working in mighty ways throughout uh, your kingdom. Uh, Lord, may that build us up as well, that we wouldn't just reflect on our own situation and our own corner of the world, but Lord, see how you are at at work in mighty ways throughout your kingdom many multiples of um, Christian coming to to know you at once and and Lord it'd be easy to become discouraged and and hope that for uh, this area and and this part of the world but Lord may we join together and rejoice in 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 your church in the building up of your kingdom throughout the world and that your word would continue to be um, sown and taught faithfully and so Lord be with us now as we approach um, your word um, give us hearts and minds that are open to hear that we might hear from you in Jesus name Amen so uh, again turn with me if you would uh, to Mark chapter 4 in your Bibles and maybe just as a, a starting point it's helpful to sort of set the scene because in Roskine uh, the church I'm part of we're, we're doing a little bit of a series but I appreciate we're coming into it a little bit cold um, and, and so it's maybe just a, helpful to get a starting point. So if you would, imagine you're going, um, you've set, you've got a plan, you're going to Ben Braggy and Golsby, and your goal is you want to climb Ben Braggy for the view. You want to see the wonders of creation from, uh, from the top. But to get there, from here, you'd have to jump in the car, get the bus, That'd be maybe stage one in your journey. Then stage two would be arriving, parking, getting to the base and starting the walk. But stage three would maybe if we could categorise it as the pinnacle at the peak, seeing the view. And then the final leg would be coming back down. If we hold that image, uh, if it's helpful for you, if not, forget about it. But the first, that first journey going, going there, we can maybe think of that as Mark chapter one. Uh, where the disciples, Jesus, come, come to the earth, and his disciples have been appointed. And then the second part of the journey, we're we're driving to Galsby. Maybe we can think of that as sort of the next couple of chapters, where Jesus is displaying his power and his miracles. Um, So that's maybe the second stage. And then we arrive at the the pinnacle, the peak, which is where we are arriving in Mark chapter 4 with Jesus teaching and it's at this peak there's also a journey down it also helps it's just, it's sort of mirrored 
Uh, there's further miracles with Jesus calming the storm at the end of this chapter. And then it comes back to the disciples being sent out. So either side you've got sort of disciples, miracles, teaching. Maybe that's a helpful bit, image for some. Again, if it's not, forget about it. But the pinnacle is Jesus teaching. That's the, that's the point we want to take away from this. So let's read now from Mark chapter 4. Uh, we're going to read verses 1 to 20. Again, he began to teach beside the sea, and a very large crowd gathered about him, so that he got into a boat and sat in it on the sea, and the whole crowd was beside the sea on the land. And he was teaching them many things in parables, and, his teaching, and in his teaching he said to them, Listen, Behold, a sower went out to sow. And as he sowed, some seed fell along the path, and the birds came and devoured it. Other seed fell on rocky ground, where it did not have much soil, and immediately it sprang up, since it had no depth of soil. And when the sun rose, it was scorched, and since it had no root, it withered away. Other seed fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked it. And it yielded no grain. And other seeds fell into good soil and produced grain, growing up and increasing and yielding thirtyfold and sixtyfold and a hundredfold. And he said, He who has ears to hear, let him hear. And when he was alone, those around him with the twelve asked him about the parables. And he said to them, To you has been given the secret the kingdom of God. But for, for those outside, everything is in parables, so that they may indeed see but not perceive, and may indeed hear but not understand, lest they should turn and be forgiven. And he said to them, do you not understand this parable? How then will you understand all the parables? The sower sows the word, and these are the ones all, along the path, and where the word is sown, when they hear, Satan immediately comes and takes away the word that is sown in them. And these are the ones sown on rocky ground. The ones who, when they hear the word, immediately receive it with joy. And they have no root in themselves, but endure for a while. Then when tribulation or persecution arises on account of the word, immediately they fall away. And others are the ones sown among thorns. They are those who hear the word, but the cares of the world and the deceitfulness of riches and the desires of other things enter in and choke the word, and it proves unfruitful. But for those that were sown on the good soil are the ones who hear the word and accept it and bear it thirtyfold and sixtyfold and a hundredfold. Amen, and may God bless his word to us um, today. Before we look at this further, we're going to sing once again. We're going to sa sing, sing Psalm 126, uh, and uh, if you're able to, we'll stand to sing this. It was a dream come true. I was there with laughter filled. Our tongues with songs anew. The nations said. Thanks, 
before uh, we return to God's word and and think about that further. Father God, thank you that uh, you are our sustainer uh, day by day, moment by moment, and uh, especially now as we come to your word, uh, we pray that we, you would give us a focus, um, you would give us uh, a mind that is is gripped on, on you, and Lord, I pray that you would renew us today from your word that we would see the gift of your spoken word, uh, your written word, and that you'd help us to see how, again, you have been faithful to us uh, generation to generation. And, and humble us in light of the, the cross, in light of your, your word, the death that was paid for us, that, that we would see the life that is, comes from you, that your word speaks of judgment, but also speaks of new life. Uh, and Lord, that these, these two things would, would be driven into our hearts, that your spirit would use them to speak to us, encourage us, and, and challenge us um, day by day. Lord, come and be with us now as, as we look at Mark chapter 4, that your truth would be spoken uh, and your name proclaimed. In Jesus' name. Amen. So if you would be able to have Mark chapter 4 open in front of you, I think that would be really helpful for us uh, just to have reference, in, especially in terms of the, the different couple of soils. Um, but this parable uh, made me think about one of my least favourite tasks, which is gardening. And um, it's one of those ones that we often look at the calendar and think, right, we're going to garden then we're not doing anything then, we're definitely going to garden. And then something more appealing comes along and and then we don't garden and it gets pushed further and further down the line. But yesterday, of all days, um, with the way the weather was, I was determined uh, we were gonna do some gardening. Uh, So I did, and gardening for us doesn't really look like growing anything new, it's more just sort of maintaining the mass and trying to get rid of the weeds um, there, there's no goal to grow anything new. In fact, re- yeah, trying to get rid of the weeds is the main objective. Um, even cutting the grass, doing the edging, uh, and Dad is always there in hand to try and advise as I sort of stress about how the garden looks and, and what the neighbours must think. Maybe, maybe you can relate to that. But in contrast to to my strategy of gardening, we're we're looking at the parable today that actually there is a there is a growth there is a goal of growth and but there's also then a reality of the the struggles with growing a crop and plants and and we can actually see this in the other two parables in mark chapter four of this growth that there is growth to be seen but but we're just going to focus um on the first parable here uh, that the one that points us to the secret of the, the kingdom of God. Uh, so if maybe the hearers there, they've had a few parables, or maybe you're getting a bit tired, this maybe sort of perked them up a little bit, and we're like, ooh, secret, I wonder what could be happening here. But for, for this morning, maybe a, a couple of signposts would be helpful. We're going to be thinking about the sower, sowing, um, in other words, the teacher teaching, And then we'll move on to the four soils, so we'll we'll break those down individually. Uh, And then what that could mean for us. Uh, So with sower sowing, 
the soils uh, and then us. But really with, with Mark, there's a, an anchor point that's always helpful to come back to in the very first chapter, Mark chapter 1, verse 15, where Jesus comes as this herald of good news, but also of, of judgment. It, we can't get go past that. And he's urging humanity to heed the warning of, in verse 15, uh, chapter 1, the time has come, the kingdom of God has come near, repent and believe the good news. So Jesus is kick-starting this action plan on earth. He's acting to restore humanity um, after we had been estranged or alienated ourselves from God. Now, this plan has been going on for quite some time, as we can see in the rest of the Bible. But really, this is, this is something quite new in a sense. Jesus has come as the Son of God, and he's come as this herald to humanity to live for God and his kingdom. And again, just thinking about this, it's, as I mentioned, there's been a few miracles happening in the chapters before, so it'd be easy for Jesus to draw a crowd, to have that be his focal point, to that, for that to be uh, his calling card, or, or however you might want to say it. It's, that could be how people define him. But with Jesus... Um, here he's really setting out his stool he's saying this is my purpose he could be seen as somebody with just great power or great authority maybe sort of challenging the the religious figures of the day but what he wants his followers to see is that he is synonymous he he is linked absolutely linked with the, the coming of the kingdom of god and that has to be paramount. That's that journey that I sort of mentioned as we came to the passage. He is sowing the word about the kingdom of God, and he's the sower in this parable. He's not just he's not going to be there just as an entertainer or a healer or wise teacher, but his goal is bigger. It's to free humanity and to teach them about the kingdom of God. So we, in some senses, and I have been wrestling with this passage, and it's easy to get sort of drawn into the parable. But actually, one of the most fundamental things is the teaching of Jesus. It, we can't go past that um, before we get into the parable. It's something that has been emphasised. It's one of the main sort of two significant blocks of teaching in um, Mark that, that, uh, that happens with Jesus. And he decides to take this time to emphasise teaching. It's one of the, the main things that we're going to focus on. So, so just have that in the back of your mind. He's emphasising that teaching, but also teaching without hearing and listening is, is pretty pointless. Um, I was thinking again, growing up in, uh, in Doric Primary School and uh, one of my teachers, who some of you may know, was very patient in trying to teach me how to hold my pencil correctly. And I'll confess it didn't work up until recently when I went back to uh, studies and I was like, maybe I'll try that way. And it's, it's so much better. I, I've only just learned after uh, however many years on. So the teaching was good, but I, I wasn't listening and I ultimately didn't get the benefit until recently. But here, the, this is the Son of God coming, speaking, driving uh, the Word of God into their, uh, the heater's hearts, and he's wanting them, he's urging them to heed the warning and to see the good news as well. It's crucial for the crowd. Uh, again, it's this judgment that Again, I, even when I was reading the passage initially, I, I was initially overlooking that, that this is a, this is a warning ultimately. We don't just strum, jump straight to the, the good news, the soils. It's not a story of, oh, the, the sower went out and had a successful um, yield in every part. There is these warnings. 
of how the, the crop can be impacted. And he's calling that out to the crowd to hear, to listen intently. And in some senses, that's paving the way for the rest of his ministry, of not just listening to what's been said here, but actually the importance of listening to the rest of his teaching throughout Jesus' uh, ministry. If not, there's a warning there, at, and at the same time, that invitation. Invitation to come into the kingdom of God, but also the warning of the reality with, in not accepting that invitation. He, Jesus, I suppose, is acknowledging in some senses, with the, the difficult soils or the soils that don't produce any fruit, that despite, even though he's offering an in-person invitation, not everyone's going to respond. Despite his emphasis on preaching, not everybody's going to hear. And not everyone is going to heed. Even though the invitation is going far and wide, as, as we've seen the sort of setting beside the, the, um, the, the sea there, it's going to the very fringes of society. It's not just sort of his invitation or his teaching isn't just staying in the temple or the synagogue. He's coming to the, the seaside towns. He's preaching extravagantly in some senses, not just to the religious figures, but to the crofters, to the fishermen, uh, to those in the seaside towns, as I said. He goes where... It, de it would be often deemed not even profitable to go, even hopeless. And again, Jesus is pointing to his ministry and the importance of proclaiming the gospel as he's come down to earth and he's here to act. So this is where we come to the soils, that the importance and priority of Jesus' teaching and hearing that, that's when we can have that sort of entry point into the soils and I've not got any creative names for the soils unfortunately it's it's just the first soil the second soil the third soil um, and then the final soil there but our, our first soil uh, look with me if you would um, just at the opening verses there in chapter uh, in verse 4 as he sowed some seed fell along the path and the birds came and devoured it so we've got there the extravagance, we're sort of seeing the extravagance on display there because the seed is going there maybe beyond the boundary and onto the path. It's, it's boundless. It's not limited. As Al was saying, I think even in the prayer there, there's the, the word, the message that is going out to all those that are there. So that the proclamation of the good news of the gospel is being heard, is not being withheld. And God is the one who is acting and sending out that message. But the devil is coming in and snatching the seed away, as we sort of see Jesus explain that later in the passage to his disciples when they ask him about it. The devil is coming along and snatching the seed away. So Jesus is even acknowledging that as he's speaking, there are going to be some there who give his word no further consideration. That there is no further impact on them from that conversation. And a soul with no conviction is, is left because the devil has been there stealing the good news away. And he's pointing to this cosmic battle that he is now being engaged in, where Jesus as the preacher is sowing and is in this battle against the, the devil of the two kingdoms. And Jesus has come to conquer and has conquered, that we can look back ourselves and see that. But that doesn't mean the devil's power is diminished, it's, it's not, it doesn't exist, it very much still does. He's still on the prowl, but ultimately, he has been defeated. And he is the one still scurrying around, looking to snatch away hope from whatever Jesus is preaching. And, and still to this day, as Jesus warns them of the, the challenges included. So 
with the, the challenges going out, in that sense, the hearers are being included in part of that battle, that they are part of the battle because they're ultimately being invited to receive the kingdom of God. And by receiving is to enter into this combat against the devil and not letting that hope being snatched away and not letting the challenge that's been driven into our hearts be snatched away. The devil is busy and keen to do that work. But ultimately, Jesus is the one who reigns and has combated and conquered the devil. But then thinking about the the second soil there, there's a little bit more hope as we look at this just from the outset. Again, look with me at at verse 5. Other seed fell on rocky ground where it did not have much soil and immediately it sprang up since it had no depth of soil. And when the sun rose, it was scorched. And since it had no root, it withered away. So, again, there's, there seems to be a little bit more hope, despite the difficult terrain. And again, rocky, uh, rocky areas. But then the seed does take root. And, but then ultimately the, the sun comes along and destroys any progress of that. And again, once again, the sower's been generous in sowing in an area that if you were to look at the field, you'd probably, if you were getting a contract to go and sow seed in the field nowadays, you'd probably turn it down thinking, they need to do a little bit more groundwork before I'm going to sow anything in there. They're not going to get a good return. There's not much hope in that field. But again, there's generosity in in sowing in areas where it would seem unlikely, where it's going to be difficult. And Jesus is there sharing the good news of the kingdom of God with people who most likely did have difficulties in their lives, like any of us. Uh, Difficulties can attract uh, people from the fringes, uh, especially with, uh, with a message of hope. There's people can be drawn in and a crowd started. And the words that brought an individual to their knees with joy, maybe in that sort of initial uh, growth that we see, are the very same words that are used against them as they face pressure or tension and sends them running in the opposite direction. I wonder what, for the disciples here, as the sort of early followers, I wonder what pressures they could have been tempted by to flee from. To leave their outpost and and wave a a white flag of surrender. Uh, Maybe the looking ahead heckles from the crowd, sort of awkward conversations with the religious busybodies what things were really going to press in on them, make them want to turn away from from this newfound joy in Jesus. Uh, I I was thinking up a situation, imagining a situation where the devil, I'm sure, would have loved to go to Simon and uh, Andrew and and say to them, oh, well, surely Jesus said you're going to be called fish for men. And then thinking ahead later into this chapter with the the calming of the storm, it's like, how can you fish for men if you're barely able to survive in a boat? What sort of pressures Jesus could use of that personal invite to them of, you're going to fish for men. How could the devil use that against them? Make them want to doubt. Make them want to turn away. Or even their families. Maybe it got even more personal. The family... The family business was struggling. That call to return to family life and help out to stop the madness of following this this new teacher and to come put food on the table, to come home. Maybe, Maybe that was just something that I was thinking on, a pressure point that could exist. Again, no record of it, but it's a popular ploy that David, uh, that the devil, sorry, uses and thinking even back to Genesis 3 the devil there uses the word of God and twists it back in on ourselves 
Uh, and I heard somebody speak about that this week, how God's word is used to drive us out of ourselves, to curve us out of ourselves. But really the devil is using the opposite. He's doing the opposite and driving us to question God's word, to question, was that really said? Is that really what he meant? That there's a caving in that's going on. But Jesus also faced these these trials and temptations in the first chapter of Mark uh, when he was tempted. And Mark doesn't really go into it in uh, this gospel, but but other gospels do. And again, the word of God's used and manipulated. Did he really mean that? Did God really mean that? Why don't you do this and, and test that out? So Jesus is personally aware of the the challenge when coming under pressure but actually he's then also as a son of God acutely aware of all the pressures that everybody else in the crowd are facing and then there's this final soil that we come to the the soil in uh, chapter 7 other uh, uh, verse 7 sorry other seed fell among thorns and the thorns grew up and choked it and it yielded no grain And again, Jesus goes on to explain how the fears and worries of this world are the things that choked the the growth. Uh, An African commentator, I'm not sure how to pronounce his first name, but Mr. Karura, um, one of the African commentators, comments on this passage suggesting that there was potential tax incentives um, for people claiming religious grounds or or, uh, claiming to religious groups, uh, if they were able to um, be able to do that. So in this sort of new wave of religion, maybe it was deemed a sort of low bar that they could get into. Oh, I could get baptised and yeah, I could agree to the things that we're saying if I'm then able to sort of change my tax code. It maybe seemed less extreme than uh, some of the, the requests for circumcision or, or other things. So it could, of, as the commentator suggests, have drawn a crowd that they were just looking for a quick fix. They were looking for growth. They were looking for uh, profits with this low bar uh, that they might see. But really, for, for each of these soils so far, it's Jesus announcing a judgment. As I said, he is proclaiming the coming of the kingdom of God But that surface level faith or religion is not going to cut it. If it's merely a change of tax code, if it's merely a crutch to get by, if it's merely just a presence, a religious presence on the Sabbath, then that will fall short of the kingdom of God and the God standard. In Mark uh, chapter 4 verse 12, there we see Jesus is pressing them to, to listen to the meaning behind uh, the parable. Because even this parable would seem that he's trying, he's urging them to capture what it means that the kingdom of God has come near. It has come near in the presence of Jesus. And it, in some senses, uh, Mark 4 is paraphrasing Isaiah chapter 5 and uh, you can look that up later if you wish but the section's entitled the vineyard of the Lord uh, destroyed and here you can see examples of scorched soils so we can see that here with the sun uh, coming up and um, because there's no rain but then also thorns and also rocks all these things you see in mark chapter 4 you can also see in isaiah chapter 5 and both passages both passages are announcing judgment and urging the listeners to hear the words of god and respond by repenting that's the crossover we see there and it's a stark message and it's a message that jesus is calling to deliver the people and that's where we see the hope of the gospel there come in as well. It's, we're not left in judgment, but there is new life. And we see that in the final soil. Um, 
as the, the secret ingredient we're seeing there in the final soil um, of verse uh, 8 fell into good soil and produced grain. We're seeing this secret it's, that has uh, become unlocked for the hearers. And it's incredibly, in hel- uh, it's incredibly helpful for uh, a, looking at this to think about the different words in uh, verse 15 and verse 20, the sort of to hearing, the uh, words hearing. And uh, apparently they're different. They're di- they mean sort of different things. Uh, for those who hear the word like in verse 20, there's ongoing growth, ongoing growth. So this good soil, that there's this on, ongoing action and there's this fruitfulness in, this, in the Christian life. So we can maybe see those two things coming together. There's ongoing growth from the, the good soil, a process of being made more and more like Jesus. And this process we, we can see again for the disciples uh, through the rest of Mark. As I mentioned, the, the storm, the upcoming storm that they're about to encounter. They're then caught up in a, a political, religious storm as well. And then the denying of Jesus. But it feels in some senses that the disciples all come on a, a journey through these soils. Maybe, maybe we do as well. But Jesus was calling us to see the importance of his spoken word, to, so to heed this warning. And, and that remains true today, that there's a warning, and then there's this offer of eternal life. This true spiritual hearing has to come from a place where God has been at work, and by his grace does uh, in the hearts of a believer. We return to God's grace. Uh, and we need God to do the work. Now, thankfully, that responsibility isn't on us to change the heart of a believer. It's ultimately God. And he has a responsibility because he will have the perfect harvest in his perfect time because it's not recorded weekly or season to season or annually or a census every 10 years. He has an eternal perspective and it's an eternal harvest that we're looking at. And with the, the emphasis on God's teaching here, it's something that we can firmly hold on to, to today with the proclamation of the kingdom of God. And resp- the responsibility, I suppose, comes to Al Sunday by Sunday or whoever is here. But then it also includes the rest of us during the week to be gossipers of the gospel, the the sort of only and only good kind of gossip, being gossipers of the gospel and living that out and sharing that. But for me, and maybe you feel this as well, it can often feel like a a heavy responsibility or a heavy burden, or or maybe we just feel guilty um, as well that we're not doing enough. Well, another commentator um, really felt like he spoke into this. uh, James Edwards highlights, uh, and I quote, Apart from sowing, the only human activity in this parable is waiting in faith, (coughs) confident of a harvest to come. The coming of the kingdom of God is likened to a process of growth, but a process strangely independent of human activity. And I think this maybe points us uh, to other parts of the Bible, like James chapter 5, verse 7. Be patient then, brothers and sisters, until the Lord's coming. See how the farmer waits for the land to yield its valuable crop, patiently waiting for the autumn and spring rains. You too be patient and stand firm, because the Lord's coming is near. So, in, in the sort of six weeks I've had at the theological seminary, I wish I had more nuggets of truth to to come away with. But really, these things, there's in pointing to ourselves and and looking at the mission that we're called to be part of. It's good to be aware of the different responses of the soils. It's good to know and sometimes reflect 
on, wh- on how we can leave a Sunday service or when we've heard the gospel, where are our hearts and where are we in that story? But really there's this emphasis on the repeated scattering of the word, being patient and continuing to do that. Be undeterred by the results in, in other ways as well, but continue faithfully to go and Jesus will bring about the good work. Be a fountain of grace in sharing the good news of the gospel and be undeterred by the efforts of, of what we see. Again, I think that's maybe thinking uh, back to this earlier part of the service and, and coming back here after so many years. It's amazing to see the building um, looking as it is, but for me, it's even more encouraging to see faces and more faces I remember, fewer names, I, I, I'm not so good with names, but it's one of those things to see how this seed has been sown, God's word has continued to be proclaimed and you all faithfully are walking in the truth and continuing to follow Jesus. That's the good news that we're called to be part of, to continue faithfully, Sunday by Sunday, coming to hear God's word spoken that has been there to put out the fiery attacks of the devil and that we might be able to continue and lift high the name of Jesus, that we can be heralds of the truth as well, that we can come expecting to hear the kingdom of God preached, but also that it's not, we're not going to shy away from the, the realities, the judgment that is there as well. The offer of eternal hope and eternal life is there for each one of us. And Jesus is the one has come to offer and he has come before us to pass that on to us. And we see that down through the church and to this day, how that has been preached. So again, it's, it's something for each one of us, if we're followers of Jesus, that that call is to go and follow him and to be sowers of the word, sowing the Saviour's way in uh, offering that hope and living out that hope day by day. Amen. Well, we're going to uh, finish and conclude the service uh, by singing His Mercy is More. So again, as the band are getting ready, if you're able to, we'll stand to sing.
to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy to the only God our Saviour through Jesus Christ our Lord be glory majesty dominion and authority before all time and now and forever. Amen. <laughs> 